recording from now. Here we go. So thank you, um, everyone, for joining us tonight. We're going to start our meeting with Yuma, who's uh, Iwadari, who's going to talk about building trust with students with Down syndrome or autism. So over to you, Yuma. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so hello everyone, nice to meet you. I'm very excited to be giving my presentation today. My name is Yuma and I'm a first year student at Toyo University. So today I'm gonna to talk about building trust with students with Down syndrome or autism. So the reason why I chose this topic that I wanted to share some tips from my teaching ex experience in a Down school for the disabled students. So before the presentation, let me talk about my personal experience. I have a younger sister who has a disability called Down syndrome. So thanks to her, I have a lot of opportunity to interact or communicate with students with Down syndrome or autism. And now I've been going to a Down school for these disabled students, sometime as a teaching assistant sometime as a teacher and I've, I've assisted other teacher in teaching students for about six years. So they told me the joy of dancing. So I am really enjoy dancing now. So, okay, let's move on to the next present, my presentation. So first, please imagine. So now you have to talk with people who speak a different language that you are now learning. And in this case, they cannot speak English very well. So how do you communicate with them? I think you have difficulty communicating or you have difficulty telling your thoughts. So you'll probably use very simple English gesture and sometimes you may need to write or draw to get your points across. And also when they speak in their different language, in their language, yes, maybe you will have difficulty listening to what they say, but I think you could guess their general meaning and keep the communication going, even though you could only catch less than 20% of what they said. So I think it's pretty similar to communicate, communicating with students with Down syndrome or autism. Yes, it's very difficult to catch their feeling and yes, get them understand what, what we say. So. So that's why I think disability is something like, um, like a language barrier. So if it's so, the more conversation we have with them, it becomes easier to understand themselves. So when you're gonna have a conversation with different language speaker, so I think um, it, it we it would be better to understand what typical features your partner has before the conversation. For example, what typical Japanese people are. Some Japanese people are polite, shy, read the air. Yet it helps to, to stay out of trouble and you can give it a try for students with Down syndrome or autism. So now I'll introduce some typical features of Down syndrome or autism. So students with Down syndrome, the one common feature is they cannot pronounce their words clearly because their tongue is thick. So sometimes you may need to guess, yes, guess their, what they are trying to say using the word rhythm. And another feature is it takes more time to, to organize their thoughts and put them into words. So sometimes you may not get a reply the same day in the past, some students sent me a letter to pair their thoughts later. So please, yes, when you communicate with students with Downs, please be patient and give them time to respond and also remember what you ask them. Yes, the third point, yes, one more thing is they are very good at feeling the atmosphere. Students in my dance school, and in my dance school, when they see someone laughing, they often laugh. When they're in a kind of serious atmosphere, they often stay quiet. 
Also, I strongly feel that we can share our emotion with each other, for example. Yeah, to do that, we can use eye contact and smiles and other facial expression with each other. For example, when their favorite song is played, they feel excited and then they look at me in order to share the emotion with me directly. So although it's not only for students with Downs, but also some students with autism, sometimes I can see their eyes sparkling too and there is a subtle smile I catch too. So I always try to catch their subtle change in their expressions. So, okay. Regarding autism, they have difficulty telling their thoughts or difficulty communicating with people. For example, when I talk to them, mostly they do not respond, ignore me or just stare at me. You might be confused, but they need time before they can respond. Yes, they need time to process before they can respond. So after you try to talk to them, then step away, give them time or give them personal space and then go back and try to talk to them. So for example, when you talk to them three times, then do not talk for about 15 minutes and repeat this process. So yeah, recently we welcome a new student with autism. He didn't say one word throughout two hour lesson. At first he just stood at the corner, but after I approached him using this method, he can gradually came closer to me and finally dance with me. So I believe that I could communicate with him even if we didn't have any verbal conversation at all. So please don't give up talking to them. They just need a bit more thinking time. So move on that teaching part. So imagine now you have to talk yeah, you, you are a teacher and teaching students who are learning your native language. And you find your students are sensing the difference between the native speaker like you and themselves and lose their confidence. How would you encourage them? You might tell them you don't need the native level. Yes, you don't need the native level to communicate. You just try your best. So, for students with Downs or autism, I think this level of perfection is also unnecessary. So if you teach them, it's better to adjust the, oh yes, it's better not to ask for perfection. So in my dance school, all of my students do not need to strike the same poses or match the movements of others. It's very important to let them think that it's okay not to be perfect. So please focus on the, what they are able to do instead of what they are not able to do. And when you assign tasks with them, what does not help the student is to take away their confidence. Yeah, for example, in my dance school, sometimes the teacher brings complicated and difficult tasks for them. And then the student realized they cannot do the same thing as normal people like their teachers. They start to lose their confidence, blame their disability, be disappointed. And finally, some students cry, quit dancing, and even leave the lesson. It doesn't lead to willing trust, but I think if they can successfully complete the task they were given, they feel a sense of accomplishment and it keeps their motivation up. And when they're motivated, they start to respect the teachers. So if you choose tasks to assign to them, it's better to adjust the level. So next, when you, when you communicate with foreigners, you should try to accept and respect the difference. This is the last point I'm gonna to share today. So when you, when you communicate with students with Down syndrome, please notice and appreciate the wide range of patterns in their behaviors. Some students have commitment they, have, they must follow. For example, um, as one student might start, start shouting in a low tone when he hears his favorite song, or yeah, one more student 
yes, my collect so many paper fans and bring all of them every day. And another student might not dance without gripping a microphone. Some people may think they are strange, but I think it's their great originality. So please, please focus on as instead of focusing on their disability or instead of focusing on their features as disability, seeing them as their originality or their personal way to communicate might be better. So this can share your impression of these students and it will also change how you approach them or how you approach communicating with them. And also student might, might definitely or student definitely notice your change and more likely to open their heart and build a good relationship with you. So as a conclusion, I will sum up the main point. Number one is please be patient when you communicate with Down syndrome, when you communicate with student with Down syndrome. And number two is please don't give up talking to them, but occasionally give them personal space when you communicate with students with autism. Number three, please adjust the level and do not ask for perfection from the student when you teach them. And number four, please accept their originality. These four tips will help you help these students feel welcome and appreciate in your classes and more importantly it will build a new level of trust between them and you thank you for your time thank you very much Yira. that was fantastic thank you thank you thank you okay so there'll be time for questions later. We're going to move on um, to Jackson now, who's going to give uh, his experience of being a non-native English speaker teacher in Japan. And well, I'll, over to you, Jackson. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you, Kifu Jiao, for giving us this opportunity. And also on behalf of Yuma for giving her this opportunity to present as well. That was her first presentation. Uh, so, yes, I'm uh, sorry. thank yeah, you for you, this opportunity. You did great. Uh, that, that was really, really good. Uh, there's a reason why you are my eighth student. So, <laughs> so. all right. Anyway, um, oh, I think Brent also has prepared a feedback form, uh, and I think there are a couple of questions uh, within the feedback form where you can give Yuma some advice uh, and also share what you have learned from her session. Uh, and it would be great if you can. Uh, give her some feedback uh, as you also think about my presentation and May's presentation. But uh, I'm going to go start talking about um, May and my presentation, which is recognizing the changing, uh, sorry, recognizing and changing the undermined reality of non-native English speaker teachers. Um, since there are some university students here, I think it's quite important to, to, to let you think, right? Do you know who your non-native English speaker teachers are who are teaching you English? Um, some of the students who I've taught, did you think, did you consider me a native teacher or a non-native teacher? Um, to start, um, this is just very quickly the schedule. I'm going to start uh, and after my part, we will take a 10 minutes break. And then it will be May, and uh, we will try to have some time for our question and answer as well before we conclude our day. Um, is everyone seeing the full screen? No problem. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, it will also be great if you could have your cameras on. I just like seeing people. I just like seeing their reactions. But if you want to keep them off, that's okay as well. Uh, during at least my part, uh, I'm going to throw up the terms native speakers and non-native speakers a lot. Oh, I recognize that these are very problematic terms. There are a lot of uh, nuance to them. There are a lot of stigma to them. And people would argue uh, the usage of these terms. But for the sake of the presentation, please just use these terms within the context of English teaching in Japan. And I think there is a very clear picture of how the market 
considers uh, some teachers being native teachers and some who are not native teachers. And to start um, this event, my part is called the experience of a carrot in Japan. To start off, please imagine with me. Imagine you are you're working at a place. Uh, you just got a new job. Uh, so you're meeting people for the first time. But as you talk to your new colleagues, you don't want to tell them where you're from. People are saying, oh, hi, I'm that that from America. I'm that that from Australia. And you're feeling that oh, I don't really want to tell them where I'm from. Have you ever been in a situation like that? And if you were in a, situa in a situation like that, how would you feel? So just imagine that as I go through my portion of this presentation. It's quite important for me to let you know who I am. Um, my name is Jackson Kunyet Lee. A lot of you probably know me as Jackson Lee, and you have never seen me talk about my Kunyet part, and there's a strong reason. Uh, I'm a full-time lecturer at Toyo University, uh, where Yuma is, uh, and I am currently the chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Uh, and I was the former Gifu chapter president, uh, as Glenn has uh, mentioned. But my background, I was born in Hong Kong and I stayed in Hong Kong for 10 years before moving to Canada. And I lived in Canada for about 12 years before coming to Japan. However, during the time when I was in Japan, I would introduce myself like this. Hi, I'm Jackson and I'm from Canada. That's it. I did that because I wanted to erase my Hong Kong part in front of my students in Japan. Because I was really afraid if I was to talk about me as someone from Hong Kong, would people think that I'm not a native teacher? Would people question my nativeness? Which was really important because when I was hired, uh, a lot of the, the trainers and the teachers and other people were saying, oh yeah, you are the native teacher in the classroom. You will be working with the homeroom teacher or the JTE uh, and you, the ALT, you are the native teacher. Hearing that word again and again and again, I got really afraid. Hmm, if I talk about Hong Kong, you know, we, we don't use English as a native language in Hong Kong. So would students start questioning me? and my qualification as their teacher. The definition of native speaker is really, you know, people argue about this, but when uh, from the years that I've been in, uh, in Japan, I see this as teachers who are from America, Canada, uh, UK, New Zealand, and Australia. These are the common uh, descriptions, the big five. So, uh, if I look at this and I go, well, if I tell people I'm from Canada, they would consider me as a native speaker. But if I tell my, uh, if I tell people I'm from Hong Kong, they might question if I really do belong to the big five. And if I don't tell people I'm from Canada, if I don't sell that part, uh, maybe people would not consider me as a native speaker. This is the fight that uh, a lot of people have to put up with. Uh, I remember getting into several arguments on the internet, being Facebook, uh, where some people would, would post a job. Uh, I would say, are you looking for only native speakers or people who are good teachers? And there was one time I got a, I got a reply. Someone said, only native speakers should be allowed to teach that language, specifically these five. That was the response I got. Right? which is ridiculous, uh, as some of you are already shaking your head. It is ridiculous. It's kind of like saying only Japanese people should be allowed to be working in a Japanese restaurant. That's ridiculous, isn't it? But there are people who push that agenda. Why? Because this agenda protects certain people. It protects the people who are from the big five, to make sure that they have a job, to make sure that they will be considered first when they 
you know, when they get promotions. And you're going to hear more about that uh, later on. But again, back to my story is, am I considered a native speaker? That was a big question I had during my early years in Japan. Being a non-Japanese Asian in Japan, um, yet there are some benefits, right? I don't stand out when I walk around town, uh, uh, when I'm on the bus, when I'm uh, you know, on the train, people are not just staring at me nonstop. So being an invisible foreigner, there are some benefits. Um, so yeah, I am a gaikokujin, but I don't stand out. Like I'm like a ninja, I blend in. I'm like a ninja gaikokujin, uh, which is kind of long to say I'm a ninja gaikokujin. So uh, sometimes I call myself, uh, oh yeah, I'm a ninjin, uh, which of course means a carrot. So this is where the title of my presentation comes from, being a carrot, uh, being an invisible foreigner teaching in Japan. There are benefits, but there are a lot of uh, negatives when it comes to this occupation or working in this industry of English language teaching in Japan. The big disadvantage is that I don't belong to neither of the two archetypes of English teachers. The archetype number one would be uh, the Japanese teachers, right? I, I'm not one of them. I don't have a teaching license. I didn't go through the Japanese English education system. So obviously I'm, I can't be one of those. So I was hired to be the other archetype, which is the native teacher. As mentioned earlier, am I considered the native teacher or the foreign teacher? Yeah, I was hired as the foreign teacher, but I don't look like one. Until I open my mouth, some people just don't know that I am uh, a foreign teacher. I used to look into the mirror in the morning, sometimes before going to school. And I just look at myself and I go, Jackson, you don't look like what students expect you to look like. And that made me worry. Because if you just go to Google and you type in Japanese native speaker, these are the pictures you will see. Mostly white people, uh, some people of color, but I, almost never see people of Asian descent. Uh, I don't see invisible foreigners when I look up native speakers. And if you actually start looking up jobs, right? If you look up Eikaiwa teachers, very similar, right? It's just one color. Uh, and I, I don't see myself along these people. In fact, the next time you ride a train or uh, you see some advertisements for Eikaiwa, try and see if you can find an Asian teacher in those advertisements. Uh, if you can't, buy me a drink next time you see me. Um, if you can, I owe you nothing. <laughs> so it's a win-win situation for me. Um, but it's really difficult. And if you think about well, what, what about ALTs, right? ALTs, the, the, the story is the same, right? These are the ALTs that, uh, that are in the pictures. If you imagine an ALT teaching uh, in a classroom, a lot of people would have this picture of an ALT standing in front of the class, in front of a class of kids. They are presenting or talking about their home country, holding their own flag. But when you imagine that, what flag are you imagining? Quite often, an American flag, a UK flag, but would you be imagining someone talking about Thailand or Singapore, right? So there is a very strong image with that. And when I was working as an ALT, I look at these pictures. I also look at my colleagues and I go, I don't know how well I fit in. And I don't know how other people would judge me based on my looks. What about the university teacher? We will come back to this. We'll talk about this later. Um, but it, I hope this helps you understand why uh, someone like me had to be very careful about how I present myself in front of my students. In front of my students, I didn't talk about Hong Kong at all for two years straight. I would only tell people, hi, I'm from Canada, right? 
um, when I would teach students, when I talk about my hometown, everything was only about Canada um, because I wanted to protect that image of the native teacher from Canada. I had a colleague who was born in Indonesia and he lived in Australia for five years. And after that, he did the same thing in the classroom. He wouldn't talk about being from Indonesia. He would only introduce himself as someone from Australia because by doing that, he got more respect and he would get less questions. For me, it was very much the same. After a while, uh, as an ALT, I realized, you know, it, uh, I've, I've realized it doesn't matter. Students enjoy my classes not because I'm a Canadian. They enjoy my classes because they enjoy my classes. They enjoy the games. They enjoy how I teach them. So I started getting confidence. And it's, I started telling students about Hong Kong. But another two years after that, I got into university teaching. And that fear came back to me. Because at the university level, I started thinking, well, you know, little kids in elementary school, they don't know better. And they have no choice. I was the only ALT they got. But at the university level, they have other teachers. They see, they hear from other students. Are they going to start comparing? Are they going to start judging me? Are they going to go, why do I get Jackson when there's that real Canadian teaching in the other classroom? And I got afraid. For two years at the university level, I didn't tell my students I was born in Hong Kong because I thought this is at a more competitive level. Students are more judgmental and critical. And I got scared again. It wasn't until I got my full-time job at Gifu University that I felt like I could tell students because, hey, I got my full-time job. They can't really just kick me out. Um, and students, maybe they will have a bit more confidence in me if they know that I was a full-time teacher. But I remember when we made our uh, poster to put outside the English center, um, they put my picture and then they put my name and then they put where I'm from. They put Hong Kong and I panicked a little bit. I go, um, can you put Canada? And they said, how about we put Hong Kong and Canada? And I go, oh yeah, right. That's where I'm from. Please do that, Hong Kong and Canada. That was six years into teaching in Japan that I finally re realized or accepted the fact that, oh yeah, I am from Hong Kong and Canada and I should be able to tell my students that's where I'm from. But it took such a long time. And this fear never goes away, to be honest. Even now, once in a while, I question, is it, you know, is it okay? Are my students okay with that? Do I need to go back to telling them I'm from Canada and push that front? When I was teaching in elementary schools, my students knew a lot about me, but they only knew that I was from Canada, right? I was half in invisible to them. You know, when they drew pictures of me, they would draw, oh, here's Jackson Sensei from Canada. Uh, he likes orange, he likes blue. I like light green. I don't know why they wrote that. Um, I'm not that fond of light green. Um, thank you, sure. See, they, they didn't know I was from Hong Kong because I kept pushing that only as someone from Canada. I would tell them about uh, famous Canadian food. Right? I would tell them about poutine and I would tell them about sloppy joe and the uh, iced maple candy and the beaver tail pastry, which Honestly, I've never eaten the beef and tail pastry or those ice Canadian maple syrup candy. I've never seen them, uh, but I had to pretend. That's the level of fear, if I could even use that word. That's the level of fear I was having uh, on a daily basis. When they asked me, Jackson, you know, can you introduce to the students what you eat at home? I would talk about Canadian food or North American food. I talk about pizza and hamburger. But in reality, my mom cooked Chinese food. When I would show them a picture of my family, um, the students would go, oh, Nihonji ni mieru, right? They, they look Japanese because 
were Asian. So they go, oh, they look like they're Japanese. And I would, instead of explaining, I would just go, <laughs> no, we're Canadian. Let's end the conversation there. That was the level of fear uh, I was in. And it's not just me. It really is not just me. A lot of teachers like me out there who are in the industry right now, they panic in very similar ways. Um, one of the pictures I really enjoy showing uh, the audience is this. Uh, I remember one time uh, I went to the community center and we had this big world event where um, they, they, they invited people to talk about their countries and they would invite um, the non-Japanese people in the city a lot of air quotes, yeah? The non-Japanese people in the city to go there and they would uh, introduce them to Japanese uh, traditions. So I went there just for fun because it was my day off. And a couple of my students were there too. And they dragged me around. Hey, Jackson Sensei, let's go try this. Let's go try that. Jackson Sensei, let's go try green tea. Jackson Sensei, let's go try origami, right? Paper folding. Oh, Jackson Sensei, let's go try calligraphy. And I sat down. And um, the, the person in charge, the calligraphy teacher there was like, okay, let's write your name. What's your name? And my students were like, oh, his name is Jackson. Jackson, okay, well, let's find some kanji for your name. And they were thinking, okay, what is some kanji for Jakuso? Jakuso, ja, ja, ah, jama no ja, which is not a good word, right? You're in the way, jama, okay, no, no, no. Ah, Jaku, you're weak. No, 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 that's not a good word. Um, song, ah, loss. Oh, no, 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 that's not a good word. Um, at the end, they came up with this, Jack Kusong, snake, long time respect. And I thought that is a beautiful name, especially since I was born in the year of snake. So we wrote that, Jack Kusong. And I brought this home right? and I, I taped it on the wall and I looked at this uh, and I, I looked at it and I went, oh, I had a really good day. You know, it was really fun. I had some green tea for free. You know, here's my name, Jackson. It's a cool name. But I have a Chinese name already. I have a name in kanji. Li Kun Yet. That is my Chinese name. That is my name in kanji. It looks like this. Li Kun Yet. I like this, Jackson, but I also quite like my Chinese name, Li Kun Yet meaning crown or number one, first place, and one being one. So my name is basically Lee One One. Um, imagine the pressure my dad was putting on, on me uh, when he chose my name. But I was just thinking, my students never knew that I have a Chinese name already, or I have a name in kanji. Hmm. And that really made me reflect and made me realize, yeah, my, my Hong Kong side is completely invisible to my students at that time anyway. Also, if they didn't know, I actually studied and practiced calligraphy for several years, um, but that's a, uh, that's a separate story. Um, of course, it's not just the reactions from my uh, students, it's a lot of reactions I get from other people. For example, you know, during open school days, uh, when parents would come. Sometimes the, the parents would go, hey, you know, they talk to their kid. So where is Jackson Sensei? Who is Jackson Sensei? You always talk about Jackson Sensei. So where is he? And, and then the kid would run up to me. They would hold my hand and pull me to the parent and they would go, oh, this is Jackson Sensei. And the parents always would go, this is Jackson Sensei? Because I don't fit the image. So no matter, no matter how much the students love me, I still don't fit the image of the typical English teacher. Um, so that is a constant reminder uh, several times a year uh, when I was an ALT. And sometimes it's from other teachers when there are new teachers coming to the school or when there is like a, an open school for uh, open school training for, for teachers from other schools, they would come and they would see the JTE and then they would see the ALT and they would look around and they would see Where's the real ALT? So these reminders never go away. Um, at the university level, to be honest, it's a little bit better because I'm the only teacher in the room. So 
you know, they, they're not they're not looking around. They're not thinking is this is this the JTE or the ALT? Um, but at the same time, it's still here. It's still with me. Remember the colleague I mentioned earlier from Indonesia. Um, he told me there was one time he was walking around town, uh, somewhere in Gifu actually, and he met someone and he started talking to this uh, old man. And the old man heard his accent and recognized that he is not uh, natively Japanese. So he asked, so, oh, where are you from? And he said, oh, I'm from Indonesia. And this old man in town, he asked, oh, which factory do you work at? Just simply, he did not fit the image of an English teacher. Now, if it was one of my white friends or black friends, you know, they, it's easier for people to assume, oh, so are you an English teacher? But for some, some, you know, someone like my friend, or I think myself too, that often is not the first thought uh, when people meet us. So the different reactions we get really affects how we consider ourselves and uh, our positions in this industry. Usually at this point, some people would go, hey, you know, Jackson, that's, you know, that's sad and all, but there are some benefits to being a native speaker. Oh, sorry, being a non-native speaker. There are benefits to that too. We know that. We know there are benefits. We know the benefits about you know, oh, your experience uh, learning English as a second language and this and that. We know that. But the whole point I'm trying to share with people is that when it comes to finding a job, when it comes to how we are being treated. And when, when I say we, I'm not only talking about non-Japanese Asian teachers. I'm talking about teachers who don't fit the image of the native speaker teacher. Often the native speaker teacher image being white teachers. So people who don't fit the image, we just don't get treated the same. We are undermined. We're undermined in many ways. We're undermined in the opportunities we get. There are many jobs we just don't apply to because the requirement says bachelor's degree, experience in teaching, native speaker. There's no point in me applying to that if they would just see my Hong Kong site and go, no, he is not native enough. Or, you know, I still have my Canadian side. There are some friends of mine, they just can't, they just don't feel right applying to them because it says right there, native speaker. By definition, my friend is not a native speaker. So why would they apply to that? Even at my job now um, at Toyo University, uh, until a few years ago, they still had native speaker. As one, of the, as one of the requirements when they put up the job application, uh, sorry, the job advertisement until uh, my current supervisor, he just said, how about we try not putting it there and see if it makes a difference? And it didn't make a difference. They got more applications. Eventually they got someone like me to apply. If they had put requirement as, uh, as if they had put native speaker as one of the requirement, I wouldn't have tried. So these are the opportunities that are lost on, uh, cer on certain teachers because that requirement is not by choice. It's a birthright. You can't, no matter how hard you work, you can't work into being a native speaker. Of course, I tell my students now, you don't need to. It doesn't, it, it doesn't affect you being a good English speaker. But when it comes to job hunting to some companies, apparently it still matters. It matters because there's an image, there's an image they want to preserve. It matters because when they create their posters or websites, there are certain images they want to push for, but it's really tough. Imagine being an ALT, this happened to one of my friends. Imagine you got hired from a different country and you flew, right? You, you moved away from your family. You came to Japan, you're excited. Now you're an ALT. You're thinking, which 
hmm, I'm going to start teaching. I wonder if I'm going to be teaching at an elementary school or junior high school. I wonder which school I'm going to get. I wonder what kind of students I'll be working with. And then before, um, as, as other teachers get assigned to different school, you get a phone call from the office and the office of the dispatch company tells you, oh, sorry, um, how do I put this? You, you don't have a school assigned uh, because the Board of Education didn't want a non-native teacher assigned into their school. Imagine how you would feel those are the opportunities that are being taken away. And it's really sad that this continues to happen. Remember what I said earlier, that we will come back to looking at the image of university teachers, right? Let's take a look together, right? Uh, let's say you are thinking, okay, I want to maybe teach at the university level in Japan. I've heard uh, that there are some dispatch companies. Uh, one of the big ones is Westgate. Uh, and some people said Westgate is good because they pay for your flight, they pay for your plane ticket. Okay, let's see. Um, teaching elementary school, no, no, no. I'm looking for teaching university. Oh, before that, here's someone, but well, here's a white woman. I'm sure it's not only white teachers, right? Uh, well, here she is again. Uh, here's a white Jackson. man. Sorry, yes. we can't see. We can't oh. see. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. Uh, thank you for letting me know. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, and we can see the two thousand tabs though. <laughs> oh yeah, forget about the tabs. Uh, I was I was doing some lesson planning before that, but yeah, thank you for letting me know. So let's backtrack a little bit. If you were thinking about getting a job with you know, some dispatch companies such as Westgate, right? You go to the website, I'm sure you would do that. And you will start comparing yourself to the teachers. I like that they have this instructor's voices tab. Uh, but just look at how uncolorful this looks, right? Let's see what kind of teachers teach with them. Okay, couple of uh, white folks, couple more white folks. Keep going. Uh, stop me when you see someone who is not white. All right, I'm, I'm waiting. Oh, here's one. Okay, Teresa, she doesn't look white. Uh, let's take a look. Because of my experience teaching Japanese students in America, within the first line, she has to, she had to tell you that she lived in America. Other teachers, right? Luke, where's Luke from? He didn't say. It's not important for him to say it because he looks like a native teacher. And for a lot of other teachers, they never talk about where they're from. It's only Teresa, sorry, Teresa, who is like, oh, I'm, I taught in America before. Let's keep going. And I think you get the picture. <laughs> you get the picture I'm trying to paint. Uh, it is the confidence or rather the lack of confidence you would get when you look at advertisements like that. May, am I okay with the full screen? Are we back to the PowerPoint? Okay, thanks. So we are. yeah, thank you. Yeah, so back to thinking about hindrance of, on opportunities. Like there are just so many jobs out there you wouldn't even try. And if you think that this is the market we're in, think about the hindrance on our confidence as well, right? We keep thinking that this industry prefer teachers who are not us. They prefer teachers who look a certain way. How would you feel? How confident would you feel when you apply to jobs? You're going to hear more about that in May's uh, session later, but just think about how confident you will be. And to be very honest, I am one of the lucky ones because I can say, hey, I'm Canadian. 
I can sell that Canadian side of me if I really push it hard. But like I said earlier, some of my friends, they, 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 they are, their English is great, but they just can't sell themselves to fit the image. And I remember I was working in this Ikaiwa, uh, part-time Ikaiwa, and they were paying me 3,000 yen per hour. And they were paying my friends 2,000 yen per hour because native teacher, non-native teacher. Eventually, when I was about to quit, uh, I told my friends, fight for a race, right? <laughs> Just fight for it. They, they can't say no to you because I'm quitting. And if they don't give you a race, I'm not going to introduce more teachers to them. They fought for it, they got a race eventually, but that's something they had to fight for. Whereas the native teachers, the standard is 3000. And it's not just money. Imagine being a teacher and the boss tells you, oh, you know, it's great, you're, you're great, your English is great, you, you're very experienced, we love you and this and that, but uh, before we advertise you, can you just give me your English name? Oh, you, you, you don't have an English name, Kun Yet is your name? Uh, can, can you choose an English name? Can you, can, can you just give me an English name that, that I can write on the poster? Oh, yeah, I know you're from Hong Kong, but um, is, it, is it possible if you tell students that you're from America? This kind of things happen. They're happening right now, but we might not be aware of it. So imagine again, back to my very first question, imagine again, can you imagine working at a place where you actively don't want to tell people where you're from? Because it might end up that you'll be treated differently. Can you imagine how much it hurts to not be able to tell people where you're from? How much it hurts to not be able to be recognized or be proud of your identity. Again, my story is not unique at all. This is happening in the reality that we are all a part of. To students too, this is happening. To some of the teachers that you know, this is the reality we're a part of in this reality called English language teaching in Japan. What can you do then? May is going to touch more on that later, but for now, I'm just going to say two things. What can you do? Number one is raise attention, raise awareness, raise awareness within your colleagues, within your supervisors, your boss, and your students too. Help them recognize what is being, well, help them recognize what is happening and take action. Simple actions can help too. Things like bringing this as a topic for 10 minutes, 15 minutes into your classroom. Things like choosing a textbook that talks about, or that has characters that are not just white, right? Things like asking your supervisor, your boss, hey, you know, I see this native teacher. Can we change the name? Can we just delete that part? Things you do might create a lot of changes that you're not, that you don't expect it might really help one teacher or several teachers out there. You might inspire someone to do something else. So every little step you take, every move you make counts. So as I end my part, I invite everyone to do what you can within your environment. And it is not you doing this to help yourself. You're doing this to make this entire reality, this dimension we are all part of, a better dimension. It is not those who are oppressed who should be doing something. It is everyone who can recognize the oppression to help. And that is my part, experience of a carrot in Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jackson. And Thank you for your very candid and uh, open experience. How long have you been in Japan, Jackson? Uh, I've been here for nine years. 
nine years. So it's counting, uh, I think, yeah, half a, yeah, another half a year and it's going to be my 10th. So oh. almost there. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. We're going to take questions later with you. That's right. Yeah, so, that sounds good. Okay, so right now we're going to take a break. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to listen to May's presentation. And then right at the end, we're going to open up for questions and discussion with everybody. We'll take a break for what time is it now? Um, and it's now 6.56. So until 7.10. Is that okay? 14 minutes. <laughs> so let's come back at 7.10. I'm going to pause the recording. So if people want to stay in chat, please feel free to do so. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. So these are the different sections, uh, five sections that I'll be talking about today. And I'm going to start by giving you all a brief introduction to myself of myself. So um, just uh, all the stuff that Jackson has talked about in his presentation are very similar to the experiences that I will be talking about as well. I will probably have some uh, unique bits in there because uh, I'm a woman, I'm from Burma, and I'm a I'm what people would consider to be a non-native English speaker teacher, and my experiences in Thailand has been uh, very different, but in a way similar also. All right, without f making, you know, more people more confused, let me just uh, begin by talking about myself. So my full name is Mei Jo U. Um, no matter how you look at it, it's not a native speaker name <laughs> or whatever the however you want to look at it. It's definitely something that most people don't even know how to pronounce. Um, that's me and my mother. Um, I just wanted to include it there because I thought it's cute and it's always nice to make people smile before you make them cry. Um, I'm from Myanmar or Burma. So there's Burma. If you don't know where it is, you can look. It's wedged between Thailand and India. And then we share the longest border with China. Uh, I say this because there are so many people that I've met in my entire life, uh, in my lifetime, where people would tell me, I don't know where Burma is. And I would get really frustrated. And I would have to say, like, do you know Thailand? And they would be like, yeah, we know Thailand. And then I have to say, like, Burma is right next to Thailand. So there it is. There's Burma. Okay, so my hometown is Yangon, which used to be the biggest city in Burma, which was the capital, but it's no longer the capital because the military decided that they would rather have a capital in the middle of nowhere. So this is where I grew up. This is the Burmese schools that I grew up in. This is how I studied English and how I studied every other subject. Um, for most of the time that I was, for actually my entire life that I was in Thailand, not sorry, not Thailand, in Burma, for 16 years, it was a dictatorship country. It still is a dictator country, by the way. Um, <clears throat> and education is very different. It's not just rote learning, but it's also very um, constrictive in the sense that you're not allowed to ask questions. You don't look at, uh, you don't do chemical, like chemistry experiments. You look at them on paper. We have to study very outdated materials. We have textbooks. We've got textbooks with very um, limited historical figures, which are not representative of all the ethnic uh, religions and different groups of people in our country. It's a very biased atmosphere that I grew up in. And I grew up with two newspapers, two TV channels all my life. And they were always just, you know, perpetuating all this propaganda stuff the whole time that I was living there. So there's not much to do except to read outdated books. I say outdated books because I grew up uh, reading a lot of older readers digest because every time we try to um, get new books new magazines delivered to our house we have like subscription to National Geographic and all that but uh, the military would deem that it's unsuitable and they would sometimes like deliver the National Geographic with a few pages cut up because they're like you're not allowed to read this part of the book so that's how I grew up and English language is not just a language for me English language is an escape out of the dictatorship 
like that I was born in. I my parents told me that you have to learn English because learning English means that you will be able to communicate with people from abroad, read other books. It's also an a sort of an earning power, right? So it's not just a language. That's how I consider English language to be. My parents worked really hard to put me in school. They you know pay a lot of money for me to get extra private tuition in English language. So my idea of learning English is not just learning English as a language. It's an escape. It's a much bigger role than just a language in my life, and that's uh, an important thing for for me to talk about because that's how I view myself as a teacher. I look at my students and I. Think of English language as a way that they would be viewing English language when I was a language learner as well. It's an escape. It's something that they can use to make a difference in their lives. So moving on that, moving on with that. So after I finished my high school from Burma, my parents sent me to Thailand, and I went to uh, I did my bachelor and I finished my masters in Thailand, and I started working part time. And then that's when I started applying for jobs. So I studied English literature, and I just was, you know, wasn't very sure that I would be able to be an English literature teacher. So I started applying for jobs as an English language teacher because the time during the time that I was、uh, teaching, I was also a student. I was teaching part time at the university, and I really enjoyed it. I enjoy talking to the students. I enjoy spending time in the class. So that's how I got into this field. And when I first Uh, went for my very first job interview. I went to this very small、uh, Thai、uh, language school、um, by owned by a Thai man, and I did a teaching demonstration. I finished the teaching demonstration. He's sitting there right in front of me, and he looked at me and he said, "So May, I would give you the job if you can do these changes. The first thing is I'd like you to wear contact lenses so you don't look so Asian. The second thing is." I'd like you to dye your hair because you know I just want you to make yourself sound more native because right now you don't look like what we would want as our language teacher. And then he move on, like he continued on. He said, "So maybe when the parents ask you, can you please tell them you're not from Burma because、um, that's not something that is a desirable thing." I didn't take the job. I came back home. I cried on the way back. I told my parents I don't know what to do, and my parents were like, "It's just one small job. You'll find other jobs." And I did find other jobs. I became an interpreter for the International Rescue Committee, which is not an English language teaching job, but I did it anyway. It was very tiring, and it was just a very taxing kind of field because I was always in touch, like. Interpreting for refugees, and it was a very. They were also mostly Burmese refugees trying to seek asylum in Thailand or in the states or in Australia, and it was a very、um, <clears throat> heartbreaking kind of job. And I really just wanted to teach, so I tried to、uh, find other jobs. And eventually, I moved to a different city in Thailand, and I continued teaching there. After I teach there, I taught there for about four years. I decided, well, you know what. I keep having these pushbacks because people are saying all the time that I'm not a native speaker. I'm not going to be able to get this job or that job, and all the job ads are, you know, <laughs> there to to highlight that. So I thought, well, maybe it's time for me to get another degree. But、um, let's just,、uh, you know, say that. I came back. I I went to England. I got my TESOL. I did my DIP TESOL too. Right after I finished my、uh, MA in the UK, and I thought, well, I'm now ready to find other jobs. Is it going to be a different thing for me? Will I have the pick of you know? Will I be able to pick any job that I want because I have the necessary. Uh, work experience. I've spent over thirty-five thousand pounds. I have done all sorts of training. I've done the theoretical training. I've done my practical training. I've done everything that I can possibly do in order for me to start teaching English as a second language in you know the context that I was in. So I thought, well, let me start looking for jobs. And so I started looking for jobs. And every job that I kind of like was looking at had this. Uh, requirement and let me just show you guys what I mean. So this is a job、um, <clears throat> site from Thailand. Okay, 
this is the biggest job site in Thailand. It's called ajan.com and this is today. I this was the same when I was looking for a job many many years ago and this is the same site. Now if you look on the front page NES non NES teachers, okay? We've got NES teachers. We've got NES kindergarten, NES Filipino. Um so from like going back to what Jackson was talking about with you know native and non-native speaker aspect of it uh, but there is also a different layer of discrimination in, in Thailand in a country like Thailand they've got job ads for native speakers non-native English speakers they've got another sort of layer for Filipino teachers um, people like me don't really fit into any of these job categories uh, so I'm not even going to like okay I'll just pick the first one that we see okay so we've got native or non-native speakers this is the salary but if you look closely you see that the native speakers get higher salary than the non-native speaker teacher for the exact same job that they're advertising and it's the same for most of the things most of the jobs so they do say native non-native speaker teachers same position in some areas some locations that is the same salary but in some of the schools it's the pay is completely different um, so if we look at this kind of job for example native kindergarten teachers for october this is the same school and they're looking for native english speaker teachers and the salary for a native english speaker teacher is 36000 baht which is a little bit over a thousand dollars but then if you look at the ict teacher for the filipino teacher it's suddenly lower 25000 baht per month this is the exact same schedule it might not be the same subject but why are the filipino teachers getting less salary than the native english speaker teachers why is it like this on the job page why are all these jobs like this it was like that 10 years ago when i was looking for a job it is still like this right now at the present and that's really disappointing so um Sorry, just going to share my screen one more time. <laughs> Hang on. So that's the initial part of finding for a, a, a job in, in Thailand. It's already quite um, disappointing and sad, after, especially after spending a lot of money coming back to Thailand to work. You might ask, why did you go back to Thailand? Why didn't you try finding jobs somewhere else? I did. I couldn't. I needed the work, the experience. So I had to like reach for the place where I could get the job experience I needed. And that's where it was. <laughs> this is the only place that I could find. I didn't have a lot of options. So yes, that's the initial part of job search. That's before you even get into the job, okay? You get a lot of pushbacks as a woman, as a non-native English speaker teacher, all of that just sort of like um, make you feel quite rather depressed, I suppose, because I couldn't find a job <laughs> at the university. I wanted to save money also, you know? I, I didn't want to just work at a school just because I needed a job. I, I also wanted to kind of save some money because I just came back from England. I was really broke. <laughs> I, I had spent every single thing that I have saved up in, in, in the UK. So I uh, actually ended up working as a private English teacher for a Japanese slash Thai man who ended up as being the biggest ball ever because he never really wanted to be a teacher. He never really wanted a teacher. He wanted something else. And it took me six months to realize that. But that's another story. <laughs> but anyway, I eventually moved to a university, a Thai university, who were very, very kind. The salary is still low, but they were really nice to me. But even in the context where there are very supportive, you know, bosses and co-workers, there are also quite a lot of pushbacks and discrimination in jobs. So 
the first kind of discrimination is was when I was asked to work on a big project at the university I was working in and there was a big project I worked really hard and when the project finished and they were going to advertise it um, they didn't invite me to take pictures for the poster they invited a white native speaker a white guy a white American guy who did not help at all with the project to be uh, the face of the project. He took the pictures, his face was there on the posters, and every day that I went to work, I had to look at it. It made me want to shoot people. <laughs> no, I didn't want to shoot people. It was just very disappointing, and I really didn't know how to address it with my boss or my co-workers either. A part of me was finding it very difficult to express the emotions I was feeling. I felt embarrassed, I felt angry, but I also felt like it's such a you know, a uh, difficult thing for me to ask them, but I also was worried that if I asked them this kind of question, why did you do this? I might lose my job. So I didn't talk about it at all. I just sort of acted like, no, it didn't really happen or that I really didn't mind. But in fact, I minded and I still think about it till today and it really bothers me. It, I don't think it will ever stop bothering me. <laughs> So the next thing was um, when we were working in a project again and this lady who came to work after I started there for after I was already working in the same position for two years and she was a nurse she's from um, she's she's Dutch and her English she's not a native English speaker but she is what we would consider a Caucasian and um, she wasn't trained to be a TESOL teacher either, but uh, they suddenly promoted her before they promoted me. And they wanted her to audit my classes. And <laughs> that, was, that was really uh, weird because um, she didn't have anything positive or productive or constructive. Th there was nothing that she could say that I could have taken from her because she was just, you know, one of those teachers who would play the same song for one and a half hours. And that was just a slap in the face. And those kind of things happened so many times throughout my career. Um, I could, you know, every time I do this presentation, I keep changing different little examples <laughs> that I give in this part of the presentation because I've got so many examples about these kind of um, things. Um, so the last job that I was in, I was working for the British Council and the British Council is actually one of the few work uh, organizations who have a very clear non-discriminative policy. So even though I was working for the British Council, I also had a lot of pushback. So one of the schools that the British Council had contract with uh, requested that they send a native English speaker teacher after they saw my name and my uh, line manager at that time. Uh, said that they only hire qualified teachers and regardless of their race, nationality, and so on. And then they said, well, can we see her face at least? Uh, we want to see her photo before we actually agree to hire her. So she refused again, and uh, we eventually had a meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting. And throughout the meeting, it was the most awkward meeting of my life, actually, because throughout the meeting, this Thai school administrator would not look at me he would just keep looking at my french line manager and he, they, they kept um directing the questions related to the course to her and every time she directs the questions back at me to tell them that this is the teacher and this is the person who's going to be in charge of the class and the students please ask her the question they would refuse to talk to me <laughs> <laughs> and we ended the, the meeting. I started teaching. I had no problems. I never have problems with the students. The students are always lovely. I've never experienced discrimination uh, in my classes. It's only with the school administrators and the adults, the parents, that I find uh, these kind of things to be <clears throat> difficult uh, to deal with. So those are some of the things that happened. Um, so now, uh, 
you know, I'm in Japan and I like being in Japan. Japan has been very kind to me. Japan is also the place where I found a lot of support system. I've met Jackson through the equity forum. I've met other people who've been really supportive. Kathleen's been there for me, helping me out with a lot of things on our Discord server. I really enjoy it. I like, you know, being a part of the online teaching Japan group as well. But there are also some sort of unconscious biases or microaggressions that I still have to face as a teacher, as a woman, as a non-native English speaker teacher, as a Burmese. So in my current workplace, sometimes I get a lot of um, negative reactions from my co-workers. Um, I get extra, extra scrutiny uh, when it comes to uh, worksheets and things like that that I have created. I also get a lot of um, remarks, but people would say things like, I got hired because they really wanted to diversify the workforce as if my qualifications and my experience don't really matter. It's just that I am the affirmative hire that they made because they wanted to look their program good using my image. And, and that belittles me. And those kind of things are some things that I still have to face, um, not on a daily basis, but reg on a regular basis. And I still haven't found a way to address these issues without, um, you know, feeling like I'm being extra sensitive or that I am trying to ruffle feathers or bring unwanted attention onto myself. But I would like to learn to stand up for myself in these areas. Um, but so far, I haven't had the, uh, the mental capacity to go through with that yet. But this year, we have a new boss, female boss. She's Japanese. And all of a sudden, we were having a meeting. And usually, they would ask all the male teachers to answer the questions first. And then it will come to me, because I'm the only female teacher. and this time around, I got to ask first because she's there <laughs> and I like that. <laughs> I really appreciate that. So maybe this year it's going to be different, finally. <laughs> so um, being invisible, just, you know, the victim of being per like perpetual nitpicking, backhanded compliments, those kind of things are on a daily basis that happen sometimes, not on a daily basis, but, but, but on a regular basis. Um, I the thing that I hate the most if I know hate is a strong word but the thing that I hate the most is when I get introduced as like oh this is May she's from Burma but she studied in England and it makes me really feel feel really annoyed because am I not allowed to sit at this desk if I didn't graduate from England what does that mean would you be introducing the native English speaker teachers this way also so that's something that I really do not like. And also when people try to give me compliments about my English, your English is really good. Well, you know, I could be really bad and I could say, I'm really not, I don't want your compliment because I don't think your English is that good. <laughs> Would you say this compliment to your native English speaker teachers too? Like, why do you think that I needed this compliment unless I'm screaming and asking for this compliment, please don't give it to me because I don't think it's a compliment. I think it's an insult. So <laughs> it might be considered something that I have carried on for so long. It might be a very sensitive issue for me, but these are some of the things that I find completely <laughs> disturbing <laughs> from my personal point of view. And because I've been teaching for over 15 years now, I, I am done with that. I, I can't take this anymore. If, if you know, people are gonna try to say things like this to me, I would just not respond anymore positively with them. And I think that that's something that maybe I have to deal with to, to talk about it without being, without sounding so combative, perhaps. Anyway, um, so that's, that's where I'm at with my career. I, um, often wonder whether I'm in the right 
lane if I should change because like I said before 10 years ago I'm looking at this website with all these job I was looking at this website with job ads and now I'm looking at this job ad site again and it's the same it things haven't changed and it's really truly disappointing and do I really want to continue being an English language teacher I'm not sure but you know um Sorry, I'm just going to skip those because I think we have quite, we don't have a lot of time left. But anyway, I still uh, have to deal with that. So there is, of course, like the dark side of being the non-native English teacher. So there's always this linguistic deficit. If I'm not very self-conscious about what I'm saying, I can just speak English like a regular native speaker. But if I start second-guessing myself, I stutter and I would just like self-correct and things like that and that's happens to me several times just now in the presentation and you can see that it's a it's a horrible uh, re reflex and i still can't get over it and it happens to me not just in english language it happens in my own native language burmese as well so <laughs> this is a thing that happens in my mind i guess um so we are always am i am i you know i'm not sure about the other non-native english speaker teachers but i think this feeling of linguistic deficit vocabulary oral fluency and pronunciation and all that am i going to have to deal with it my entire career is it me scrutinizing myself or is it the other people scrutinizing me or or is it both you know this is something that i would have to continue to deal with so um this is a question that I ask myself when a non-native English speaker teacher of English is able to speak with a near native accent. Native speakers consider what is being said to be more credible than when some are uttered by someone speaking with a mild or heavy accent. Do you think he is right or wrong? That sort of thing. Like, do I think that also? Sometimes I do think that I have caught myself thinking about this. This is not for us to share if we can share if we want to, but this is something that I keep myself I keep asking myself because I don't want to be the person that uh, who imposes these kind of discrimination on other people um, subconsciously. So the thing that I also continue to deal with is something that Jackson was talking about in his uh, presentation, the um, inferiority complex. So when you were talking about uh, the stuff that uh, Canadians were eating and that you've never eaten before some of the food stuff and things like that it's it's on a larger scale for me I teach English I lived in England for a couple of years but other than that my entire existence has been in Burma and in Thailand these are very far different contexts from the English language speaking world so um, when I go into a classroom I'm supposed to be an expert of this language while I'm also supposed to know um, the culture and and you know things that entails this language this this language that we're all trying to learn that we're all trying to teach so is that kind of thing is a is a difficult um, balance to strike I don't care about it as much anymore in the past three years because I've learned to deal with it. I've learned to accept myself as a teacher of English from Burma and I've basically incorporated a lot of storytelling in my classes to highlight to the students the things that I know, the things that I don't know and I've tried to normalize it in my own way for myself and also for the students so I don't really feel that uh, pressure as intense as it did uh, maybe about uh, 10 years ago when I started teaching. So <clears throat> that's what I was trying to say, like a non-native RP speaker is incongruent if she's wearing this linguistic mask without combining it with the mannerism and cultural features of a native RP speaker. So if we don't know about this country or the context or the culture that we are, um, you know, talking about, are we less than? the people who are from these culture and the context, 
the answer is no for me, but of course it depends on the, the, the courses and the situation that we're in. If anybody asks me to explain baseball, I don't think I can do it at all. <laughs> I know there's a ball and I know there's a bat and that's just it. <laughs> so um, this is something that, again, a point to think about, I guess. I think about these quite often. Um, of course, and this comes back to what Jackson was talking about. This reflects very like uh, similar ways what Jackson was uh, talking about. We know that we have a pedagogical and a linguistic, you know, uh, benefit of being a non-native English speaker teacher. But embracing it and believing it and applying it in your daily life in the classroom, day in day out, throughout these years, through in the me in the meetings, uh, through the microaggressions, through the discrimination all these things is a difficult thing so I know that I can be a, a good model of imitation for my students and I do use that to my advantage very fully because I have learned the language I've gone through the process that they have gone through and I use that to my utmost advantage and that's how I connect well with my students and recently as a Burmese who grew up in Burma and also who didn't, you know, went to an, go to an international school or uh, I studied English at home with my grandmother. I tried to use that as a, um, as, as a, a discussion point for my students because I want them to kind of see that you don't have to be in a native speaking English country. You don't have to grow up there. You don't have to be taught by a native English speaking teacher in order for you to be able to talk about, uh, use English successfully and fluently. Um, so this one, I'm not quite sure. I'm still kind of like thinking about it, teach language learning strategies more effectively. There were some strategies that I have tried as a learner when I was a learner and it had worked and I've shared with my learners. I'm not sure this is a something that is uh, limited to language learners or non-native English speakers only. This might be something that is a shared thing with all the teachers who speak more than one language, despite of the fact that they might be native English speaker teachers or non-native English speaker teachers. Um, so self-awareness and empathy in the learning process is very important. Um, I have gone through a lot of ups and downs as a language learner and being able to express these uh, ups and downs coherently with your students is a very important part of trying to bond with your students as well, I think, because when you kind of like give an example of how uh, you know, much you struggle as a language learner, it kind of bridges this bond with your learners because that's exactly where they're at. And you also kind of highlight to them, this is maybe your end goal or maybe, you know, like I'm standing here, I, I learned English just like you at one point and now I'm here, so it can be you also. Um, so this is more, more of, more related to personal, like, uh, I guess personal identity, not just an identity as a teacher. Um, I just learned to be more accepting of myself as a person, as an as a teacher, and all these difficult things that I have gone through. I feel has made me more resilient. I don't. I although I feel angry or you know sad about some things and question myself from time to time. I have also learned that. Um, I kick ass, <laughs> I think. So <laughs> that's that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> um, there are some books that I've read over the uh, last seven months. These are not the only books. There are actually three more books that I've read, and these books have actually helped me feel really heard, and um, I don't feel like I'm marginalized anymore. I feel like there are so many of us and our voices are so much stronger and there are so many people who are willing to share their stories. It's not a stigma to share your stories and your negative experiences anymore. You don't have to feel like you're in danger of losing your life, not life, your job, <laughs> your job, sorry, not life. That was a bit dramatic, just job. <laughs> your job anymore just because you're sharing your unpleasant lived experiences. Um, so uh, the things that I've learned is 
got to invest in myself. I've paid a lot of money to do my degrees and sometimes I question all of like the time that I've spent the money and time trying to pursue all these extra uh, certifications and degrees but it's never wrong. It's great. It helps you build your confidence. So if you are able to do it, I think this is something that everybody should do. Native English speaker teachers who are Caucasian, who are white, who are white male, who are like the most, you know, like sought after people in the English language world also you should invest in yourself if this is for everybody <laughs> um, I embrace everything about myself my accent my weaknesses I don't have to pretend I'm free I am who I am I'm from Burma I speak Burmese and I speak English with a slightly different accent sometimes I pronounce things like an American sometimes I pronounce things like a British and it's just a combination of my experiences as a as a as an English language learner user and a teacher um, so this is something that I'm still continuing to work on like discriminative behavior microaggressions I would like to be able to address these kind of things with my colleagues more openly I want to have a open discussion with them without feeling like I'm going to be pushed around or without feeling like they're going to be considered bad people for acting the way they do. I want to choose words that will allow people to have a conversation, not push them or accuse them of being something that they are probably not just because of a word or a phrase that they used or said. Um, this is the same thing, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to talk to my colleagues more about unconscious bias issues. I also want to be able to talk to my boss about some stuff that I feel uh, they are very culturally ingrained in. So um, in the English camp, which happened a couple of weeks ago, I invited the speakers. I'm the one who arranged all of it. Yet in the meeting room, my boss, my this is not the female boss, this is the male boss. He asked my Caucasian American colleague, how did you come up with all these amazing speakers? <laughs> and I'm just sitting there thinking, excuse me. <laughs> These people were invited by me, but but the fact of the matter is that he just kind of assumed that every wonderful idea that comes up is that man's idea and not mine, and and this is something that I I don't know how to deal with in a way because you know how do you address it? You can't just jump in and say like excuse me and then just be really <laughs> like combative. That makes it that makes you look like the angry woman and you know as a woman you're always at the brink of being the dramatic angry woman being accused of this over overly sensitive woman so you have to kind of pick your battles um, so that's something that I'd like to address but I'm not really sure if the, you know time is and and the context and the location and all of that is right for this like the occasion is right for this but um, I certainly would not like to experience these kind of things every day. <laughs> it's tiring. Um, I tell stories about myself in the class all the time. My students, I think actually a few of my students are here and um, they listen to me. They know about my stories. They've taken interest in some things which are happening in my life and also in my country, giving them a much bigger reason to learn English, you know, not just for the classes, but for other things as well. Um, so uh, the last part of this presentation is just a very short idea of what we could do, you know. We can challenge the native speaker's ideology because it perpetuates that native English speaking teachers are the ideal in everything. So we need to fight this. How do we fight this? Well, I think we have to make a conscious effort to include or to seek out diverse array of speakers at events like this one. We've been given an, a platform to amplify our voices and I'm super grateful for it. I think that we need to have a lot of a lot more plenary speakers in conferences. So this is a study that was done very recently and they found out that out of the 416 plenary speakers that they analyzed, only 25% were non-native English speaker teachers. In some conferences, 80% are native speakers. 
So we need to put non-native English speaker teachers at the plenary to show that we as language learners, at one time language learners, have a lot of useful method methodology, pedagogy to share with uh, you know, the rest of the other people who are teaching the language without actually having learned the language. So this is something to think about. Um, so the last thing is the notion that having greater consciousness of the spaces we inhabit and our relation to others may lead us to act more just, justly in the world is an appealing one. I admit, and one that has helped to shape my own teaching. So this is something, this is a quote from James. It resonates with me very closely. I look at myself, I check myself all the time. I know I am sometimes at the you know receiving end of the discrimination, but I also don't want to be part of the um, inherent bias where I'm trying to stereotypically judge people without actually having to know them. And I think the first step is always about looking at ourselves, within ourselves, to see, um, to question, and to see what we can do to change it. And once we start changing ourselves, the way that we talk, the way that we think, the way we view things, maybe that's the first step in changing the bigger system. Of course, there are other more practical things that we can do too if you're in the position of power to make a you know, positive, effective, big changes. But at the same time, I think a lot of the changes come from within. And I say this because the discrimination that I have dealt with comes from two groups, one from the privileged group and one from people who are very similar in ethnicity to myself. And so this is, uh, this is the reason why I look at myself, I question myself a lot of the times because I think that we sometimes look at ourselves as the enemy more than the other people. <laughs> so that uh, finish, that um, ends the presentation that I have prepared for all of you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meg. We have a few minutes left for, for questions, um, so I'm not going to take up time by speaking because I'm sure some of you have some burning questions that you'd like to ask um, over of our three speakers today. So if you have a question, please feel free. Okay, so, well, lots of hands going up. Um, so, you can go. Can we start yes. with you? Okay, so thank you for a wonderful presentation. My name is Yukiko, and I'm a part-time English teacher in Aichi. And uh, especially for me, um, um, personally, this is the first time for me to meet a person from Burma, Myanmar, Myanmar. So I got a strong interest in your life and your experience in your country. So there are so many questions, but two is one is um, pure curiosity, but uh, the students were wearing uniform, the white shirt and green, like the pants or skirt, are they uniforms and why they're green? And also what uh, I understand you are in Thailand because Myanmar and Thailand is close to each other, but what made you come to Japan ah, to, from okay. Thailand? So these are two, <laughs> I mean, there are so many questions I want to ask because it's the first time for me to meet someone from the Burma, but and these are two questions I want to ask. Thank okay, you. thank you, Yukiko, for your questions. Yeah, Jackson? But Hold on, um, Glenn, just for the Q&A part, I think we can stop the recording. Okay. Uh, because I think there will be some personal questions. Okay. Or just in case there are personal questions.